When Tom and I decided to do this, we wanted to do something really, really cutting edge, like combining LIDAR and GPR. Who would have thunk that the really cutting edge thing is to try to help him get give his presentation, at least remotely, while I give it in, in real time here? So thank you for your patience. So the talk is about just that, combining what's above the ground with what's below the ground. And uh, Tom is the gentleman over there, and I am Doria Katrubis, as you already know. So we're gonna go basically into what is LIDAR, what does it do? And then we're gonna go a little bit into GPR. That's the bad news because, you know, when Tom couldn't present to here in person, he's like, okay, you get to talk a little bit about GPR since you're here. Um, and that's good because I, I don't like a little black box uh, presentation about GPR. LIDAR, and we combine the two. Uh, we use uh, the example of Truro Park even though and Newport Tower, even though we have done this uh, with other sites. So again, we'd like to thank Mira for the funding that allowed us to do this, to do both LIDAR and GPR of Newport Tower. So what is LIDAR? It was invented in the 1960s. And basically, it was used for satellite applications, and it was used for, you know, high, high elevation satellites. And then as we came back down to Earth, we found that there were all, there were all sorts of other new applications. And there's four different types, general areas of LIDAR. There's airborne LIDAR. There's drone or UAV li uh, type of LIDAR that's on these drones. There's terrestrial or tri tripod mounted uh, LIDAR. And then there's the mobile and, and handheld LIDAR. And each of those has a, an application. Like for instance, you can't picture Tom walking around with a 3D handheld LIDAR in the middle of the Mayan desert, uh, the Mayan uh, tropical jungle. So with the airborne LIDAR, you know, initially you were getting, oh, maybe four to six uh, scans, you know, points per meter, square meter. And now we're up to maybe about 400 to 600 points per square meter. That's a big improvement, 100 times. With the drones, their accuracy is improving too. Uh, you get about 100 to 700 points per square meter, and the accuracy is, you know, up there, three centimeters to 10 centimeters. With the tripod mounted or the terrestrial um, LIDAR, um, this is used more in construction to verify or design to verify bridges uh, before they're built. And they're really, really super expensive systems and they're very, very accurate. They're within a millimeter accuracy and like half a million points per square meter. It's pretty cool. So these are other examples of mobile and handheld uh, LIDAR. And they're about 300,000 points per square, um, you know, second points per second, excuse me. And, uh, and of course, you are very familiar with Tom and his 3D LIDAR surveys, and he gets about 150,000 points per square meter the way he walks. And it's basically mounted on a tripod as he walks around, and he does lines that are, you know, every eight to 10 feet apart. And uh, he's able to capture things out to you know, 80 feet on either side of his each traverse. So why use mobile or handheld LIDAR to document these ancient sites? Well, this is a kind of a no brainer because you can tie the LIDAR with the GPS and it provides a real time ability to capture these. And it, you are able to get rid of the vegetation. So a lot of these sites are overgrown so you're able to like see alignments and things like that, that we wouldn't be able to see. And you're able to geo-reference everything. So it's proof that we can bring to the SHPO, you know, that, hey, we really do have something here. It's not about, it's not in our imagination. 
And uh, it is probably the most versatile way of documenting these sites, um, other than say 3D photogrammetry. And below um, you see uh, a lighter scan of uh, Truro Park of what's it's you know what's above ground, and we're trying to combine this what's below ground. Enter ground penetrating radar. Uh, well, radar has been around since the you know mid to early 70s, mostly for uh, military use. Um, but now, you know, it's since like the late 70s, early 80s, it developed many commercial uses. What it does is it uses microwave energy and radio wave energy. So basically from say 100 megahertz all the way into the gigahertz range. Um, and what it does is it transmits these signals into the ground uh, and not at the operator because it had this nice shielding on top. You don't want to zap the uh, the operator. And it reflects, it detects the reflected energy from anomalies. And mostly what, what causes these reflections are small and subtle changes in the electrical properties or the physical properties of the material. And as, uh, the electrical properties say conductivity, how conductive it is. So... Um, the radar system is, you know, does consist of three different components, the control unit, which is what that gentleman is looking at, the antenna, which is those in the yellow box there, and the cables that enable them to talk back and forth to one another. So the metal targets are really easy with the radar. Um, again, many commercial uses, underground storage tanks, utilities, that sort of thing, rebar to verify, you know, uh, how something is constructed like a slab. Um, what we look for in the archeological world um, it, are voids, you know, basically um, organic matter decomposes. And so it creates spaces and the GPR is gonna pick up on that. Why? Because there's not only like, uh, a greater amount of moisture in there. Um, so that's kind of reflective too, but it's less dense. So there's this couple different reasons. And radar is also good in mapping stratigraphy um, as well as changes in water table. So this is what a typical uh, radar antenna looks like. It has a front lobe and it has a back lobe. And it typically looks about oh, five feet in front of the fore and aft of the antenna and about two and a half feet, three feet side to side from the antenna. So this creates an interesting kind of response. People expect to see, you know, you see this little, you know, on CSI, oh, there's a skeleton right there. There's a scapular, you know, no, that's not what we see. What we do see is, you know, here is the real life up here. Here's a cavity, there's a lens, here's the interface. And what we see is sort of like a little, we call it a hyperbolic type of reflector. We see a flat reflector from the lens and we kind of see more or less the shape of the, of the stratigraphy. Um, so yeah, you can figure out what's what, right? So um, each wave looks like this. This is your transmitted pulse. And then all this gobbledygook below there is reflected energy. And that is really simple to interpret, right? No. Yeah. So what we do is we colorize that. Say the red there is zero amplitude. So you have a wave that has positive amplitude and negative amplitude. And we shade, you know, each of these little, little incremental amplitudes with a certain color. And this color transform, white is the highest amplitude and gray is the lowest amplitude. And the brown and the black is uh, near zero amplitude. So as we go over the target, you're detecting the, uh, remember five feet ahead of you, you're picking up that target and your horizontal scale here is your distance. And your depth scale here is your vertical axis. So you're picking it up far away. It's really a, a two-way travel time. So radar waves are bouncing, hitting the target, coming back. But as the antenna is moving, you're right on top of it. So as you're getting closer and closer to the target, that's where you see the crest of the hyperbolic. And then you're moving away.
right? So now you know what that is, right? Uh, no, that's uh, actually an underground storage tank. Could look, could look like a utility, could look like a void, could look like a boulder. So, okay, we still need a way, you know, instead of always like visually inspecting radar, it leads you to a lot of um, frustration because it's subjective as hell. So here we go. This is what we, this is our second method of interpretation. And what we do, and I apologize for it's small little squares, each radar gram, again, this is distance and this is depth because we sign a, a velocity to it. And we take each little cell here, which is an incremental change of horizontal X and vertical Z. And we find what that velocity is and what that amplitude is. And we save it into an array of a computer. So, okay, we, know, we now know that that particular cell has a certain amplitude. And then what we go and do, here's our line that we're on and says, okay, let's look a couple cells forward, a couple cells back, a couple cells down, and let's look at the next line and the next line and we'll go, we'll go across to it. And so then the program takes light amplitudes and shades them, similar colors. So the highest amplitudes are the reds and the oranges and the yellows and the lowest of the dark blue. In this particular instance, uh, we're missing data where it's white and uh, we're looking for a water leak. And that little cyan colored line is a little pipe and that's another little pipe and that's where it broke and that's where the water is spilling about 2000 gallons per day. Um, but this is an example deliverable for all you landscape architect folks. This is the James Arnold Mansion. And for all the Massachusetts folks, the Arnold Arboretum, he was the gentleman who had such a fun time doing landscape architecture, uh, architecture at his own home in New Bedford, he decided to gift the city of Boston with a, a similar type of uh, arboretum. But what these lines are, are the old uh, bedding, the former landscape gardens that he had, which is really kind of cool. You can, you can detect really subtle, subtle features from here. Um, in this particular uh, survey not shown, we also found what the, where the outbuildings were. So as I said all along, Tom and I have been working, you know, really, really Tom trying to nudge me in the right direction. Hey, let's combine them too. So um, off we go. And um, Tom, do you, can you talk about this or? Sure, I can talk. Um, so the approach at the Newport Tower was we were hired by NERA independently of each other, but because of our relationships, we've continued to work together to, to try to combine the datas. And so our work at the tower was non-invasive. Our technologies are non-invasive. So there I am on the left with my scanner on a small pole, just there above my head. Uh, Sam is pushing the radar uh, unit. And then in the scene on the right, Sam is taking GPS points for me so I can geo-reference my LIDAR data to Doria's GPS points, which are real world points. And so that way we're able to um, provide information that would fit into Google Earth or any other um, geo-referenced uh, data set. So Newport Tower is within Turo Park in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, the image on the top there is an oblique view of my LiDAR scan with a black background so that uh, the features uh, jump off the page. But with the third-party software I'm using, the Vision LiDAR, it enables me to pretend as if I'm flying through and over and across the landscape. Hence, the, the scene on the bottom is a cross-section, again, of the scan, but manipulated in a way to create a, a cross-section. And as a landscape architect, that cross-section on the bottom would take me mm, half a day. Once my data is captured, that took about 15, 30 seconds. Go, go, uh, zooming in closer, uh, this gives you an idea of the resolution of the, the scanner, 300,000 points per second, 150,000 points per square meter. Not photographic, but a heck of a lot better than the aerial and the uh, 
the, the drone uh, LIDAR only because of the height and the speed that they're flying. And so with this, Dory, I wanted to let you know, run this video through the whole length because you've got three different animations in this one video. And so you can talk about your data here. Now, so bring your cursor here. Yeah. And so now tell, uh, we, we double click. There we go. So what you're seeing is all the reflections in this color transform with the red is the highest and then the yellow and then the black. What you're looking at are a combination of boulders and areas of excavation. What's the maximum depth? Uh, in this particular instance, I think we went down about seven feet. Dory, I want to stop this for a second. So okay. three years ago on the first project that Doria's team, uh, specifically Cameron, uh, Russ and I worked on a cemetery in Longmeadow, he presented his data, which is similar to this, to the client. I was so impressed. I asked so many more questions than the client because I saw so much application. And as you look at the red um, anomalies here, the red reflections, I said to Cameron after the meeting, how can we get your data into my software? I want the red, which I jokingly say is the fruit in the jello fruit salad without the jello, which is all the other colors. And at the end of the presentation, you'll see what I mean. On this diagram, uh, true north is where? The grid. Um, that is a very good question, which is why it, everything needs to be geo-referenced. So you're looking at the raw output from GPR slice. So if we, is there a way I can advance this? Yeah, but you're going to, you're going to fly through two other animations. So right here, we're looking at surface level. So right here, I'm going to pause it again. Yeah. So where it says depth over here, you're looking at a slice that is from the volume 1.3 to 1.7 feet below grade. And what I've done with these uh, lines here is I've assigned a depth range to them. And it's the outline of where I think the boulders are um, from beneath each column. And the eight numbers represent the eight columns of the tower. Right. And the gate is between uh, one and two. So that's north on the, on this, on the thing there. So I'm going to set this going again. So it's, it's going from top to bottom, bottom to top. And, um, and the, the boundary is the edge of the octagonal sidewalk. So the, yes, yes. In this particular, the fencing, I believe. Fencing. Yeah. So these are the each of the columns. So you've got the grass inside and you've got the, the iron rod fencing on the outside, which can, uh, metal's reflective. So you can actually pick up, you know, some of those reflections from the side. But the thing about the, the columns in GPR, Physically, the GPR could not get right up to the columns. We had to use a, a different GPR system because it allowed us to get within six inches of the column. The physical housing, um, again, GPR will pro you know project a few feet fore and aft, but physically, the housing block you know was being blocked by the by the column. Can you run that in? Hey Dory, we got ten minutes left, so we need to run this. Okay, I'm. I'm. Uh... No, no, let it let it run because the next animation is good too. Okay. So the other thing you are picking up are the excavations. Dory, my excavation so um, this particular site was used um, since 1950. You know, other archaeologists came and they did digs and they did test pits and um, we pick up that, you know, so it's kind of hard sometimes to see the forest through the trees.
All right. And then I guess this is the last one for this one yes. where we're just showing the outline, you know, and then as we're going down, you know, going slicing down and coming back up. So again, the light pink is the topmost outline of the boulders. And then we're just continuing on down. And the idea for the three different videos was to illustrate how Doria can present her data in a multitude of ways. That's the idea. So explain what we learned about the excavations from this. But I, I was trying to read your thing to see what parts were actually excavated and what parts weren't. So what we learned is that the reflections from both the excavations and from the boulders, the goal was to see how the tower was constructed, how it was supported. They knew nothing about how this tower was supported, let alone who built it. Um, a lot of different theories. And um, this is, uh, you know, the radar will show the reflections from where it's been disturbed before, but also it's showing where the boulders are. And um, with radar, you need context. So by combining the LIDAR with the GPR, it gives the GPR context. It's a very powerful tool. And um, so you can kind of see the, the shadow of the, of the thing and you can kind of see boulders underneath. This kind of appears as a continuous layer. I will show more there. In this particular um, visualization, this is from um, the top looking down. Again, this is the LIDAR. And you can see uh, the stuff interior is is really from just the excavations. It's a it's a shallower um, depth slice. And then you, the nice thing about combining both the, the GPR and the lidar is you can kind of look underneath. The yellow represents like one of the high in this color transform one of the highest reflections. So you have you know boulders there and boulders there, and you get a column there, and there's an enlargement of it. I mean, that's the neat thing about the LIDAR is that you can zoom in, you have 300,000 points, so you don't lose resolution when you zoom in. Here is another shot. Um, again, here's a tower. Here's a, a cluster of, um, you know, here's a cluster of boulders, another cluster of boulders beneath that column, another cluster of boulders, another. So every column, you can see an area of higher uh, amplitude reflections beneath them. Remember when I said, oh yeah, that looks like a horizontal layer? The first survey we did, uh, we did find a horizontal layer. I thought initially it was bedrock, but it looks like that there is um, like in between the columns, there's like another layer of small stones to level out at about four feet or so. Uh, maybe a little bit, you know, just under four feet in the middle of it, but it's it's like a pedestal built of uh, of small stones with the larger boulders at the columns. Um, and again, that's from the radar. And this here, you can see um, how that you know that layer appears. And these are other um, examples. Okay. So standing on the top side of the tower, left hand image. A little sweep out there. What what are those artifacts? So right now you're looking at um, the top of a layer, a stratigraphic layer, which I believe is um, you know flat stones, like the flat stones are here um, at at about um, three and a half, four feet. And then it, it drops off to four, you know, and a half feet, five feet, and then is deeper over to the uh, northeast. Um, what this is over here, I'm not quite sure. We have depth slice images actually past the sidewalk, and whether there are post holes there uh, from an awning, uh, you know, sometimes I see there's something there, and sometimes I don't. Uh, not enough to, um, I, I'd probably have to do a little bit more, you know, work there to really investigate it. Um, so one more view of the different uh, aspects of presenting it. And then this is uh, an embedded video also.
So again, here is the, the LIDAR scan of the park, and it'll transform to RGB color, which you see here, to color by class. I'll turn the classes off, on and off, and we'll end with a, uh, a few seconds of the tower with the GPR underneath. And, you know, I included this for those of you who haven't seen my LiDAR and what the software can do, uh, give you some indication of the power of the two. With the software, I can isolate individual features and turn the everything else off. And so what I'm doing now is isolating the tower. And that's the radar underneath it. Yeah. That's that layer I was telling you about. So the fence was classified. Turn that off. The ground in my LiDAR was classified. I turned that off. The ground in Doria's GPR work was classified, I turned that off, and that array of colors is the ground penetrating radar data. And what you'll see here is I'm going to isolate even more of this and then turn off the jello out of the fruit salad. And on, on February 6th of this year was the first time we were able to accomplish this goal. It took three years to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And so what you can see, what you're looking at here, extrapolate this to any other site that you might be working on or investigating and figuring yeah. out, well, if I had LIDAR, what could we do with it? And if I had ground penetrating, what could we do with it? Yeah. Well, you know, we've shown you the power of our technologies and our software in this presentation. And so there's the fruit in the jello salad. <laughs> Is there any intent to expand the circumference around the tower? outside the fence the question the question was is there any intent to expand the survey outside the fence and that is up to the powers that be at nira well but the purpose of the work was to do what we did to try to support the uh investigation by nira for osl dating at the base of the columns to try to date it and therefore possibly figure out who may have built it Great, but, but we do have, there's data that we fused together because the GPR extended outside in a larger swath outside the center area of the tower, correct? Yes, yes. So the out, outside the area, there's uh, another data set um, that was GPS guidance only, which had some issues with it. So we would probably want to set up a, a grid. Um, well, we're very good with GPS. Uh, with Canopy, it's not so good. Yeah. So okay. that ends the GPR and ground penetrating, uh, ground penetrating radar and the LIDAR. And now I want to do is take a couple seconds to introduce you to the new technology I purchased at the end of last year. I purchased the Insta360 Titan, which is a three-dimensional, 360 degree professional grade camera that captures individual pictures and videos. It has eight lenses, 200 degrees fisheye lenses. Photographs are JPEGs and DNGs. Videos are MP4 and HOVs. Has nine onboard SDR cards or SD cards, and it weighs 12.1 pounds. But what's really interesting is I can set this up to download or upload to Google Street View and have it be on Google um, for Street View um, investigations. But also, it's ideal for VR headsets, in-depth and inversion, immersive tours. And that's what the, the can, uh, camera looks like. And so, the, yep, 37, Doria. Okay. And so here, to end on, is a video of a 360 degree camera and it's literally 360 degrees above to the sides and below 
And this is a site, Manitou Hashanash Preserve in Hopkinton, Rhode Island. And, you know, this is just to give you an idea of the resolution. It's 11K in resolution. And we can spin it fast, slow, up, down, zoom in, zoom out. But what I can't not do is I cannot change my elevation of the viewing like I can with my LiDAR scanner. So it's a fixed elevation, but I can rotate it in any of the 360 degrees. And we had another video to show you what a video of a video would look like, but we just didn't have time to include it into our presentation. There's a question out back. Tom, are you ready for us to have questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Let this play, though, but ask questions. Okay. Uh, hey, Tom, it's Glenn. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, the, uh, the question is, you're prepared to say that we see elements of the foundation of the power in that, in that uh, So Glenn is asking... Is it fair to say that we're seeing elements of Newport Tower in the, uh, beneath each column? The foundation of the tower. I would say yes. I would. That's what my, that would be my bet. Too much of a coincidence. Right, and there seems to be um, a small stone layer you know, some layering, the flat, flattish layering in between to kind of level it off. Yeah, that was a question after you said about four feet down is flat layer of gravel. Yeah. So that would be similar to construction today where you dig a bit, put down a layer of modified, pop back there, and then build those columns on top. That's what it appears. Because I I also visually, look, visually looked at the data besides, you know, doing slice. Okay, I'm blinded by the light. Next person. This is playing over here today, but yeah, from my perspective here, I couldn't tell because of the, the ground penetration radar didn't go that far out. Whether that could be a natural layer of material that just may be pervasive across the whole site. Um, any sense? Were there any archaeological bits dug somewhere else to say that or this is that same layer further out from the further region? So um, for this one here, we did extend beyond the sidewalk. See these little blue dots? Yeah. That would be the presumed location of potentially post holes associated with some sort of canopy or apron. Um, but I didn't really see a whole lot of evidence in the slices with that. Some of them maybe. But we did extend a little ways beyond the, um, the, the the concrete walkway, the circle. And it does look like that um, whatever that layer is, it definitely gets deeper as you go further away from the tower. The blue dots are under the present sidewalk area. The blue dots is someone's conjecture of where post holes would be should they exist. Okay. So. Uh, those are just spatial orientations based off the uh, the pillar spread. Correct. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, um, kind of light exists in the, the celestial light in the, in, within the tower. Is there any orientation? In the... Where is Jim Davenport? He I, has a whole book I saw on. Saw some sort of lighter. Jim Egan, excuse me. Yeah, so the answer is um, whether the tower was, was constructed with some funding from Queen Elizabeth or whatever, there are some celestial alignments. And he would say that um, that with the equinox and the solstice, the, um, the sun goes right through the tower windows. Also but, Easter. Also Easter? And it took into account variable date. <laughs> quite, quite remarkable as uh, left field alignments. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, we're kind of at the end of time. I don't know if Tom has any concluding remarks or if there's one more slide or.
There's a thank you slide. Yeah, yeah, there was a thank you slide. That was it. That was it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.